great pleasure um, to invite in this conversation, my dear friend, guide, mentor, yoga teacher. Um, and today we're going to talk about the last three limbs of Ashtanga Yoga. And these are Dharana, Dhyan, Samadhi. Remember last time we spoke about uh, Dharana and today we'll speak about Dhyan and Samadhi. And the combination of this practice, Dhyan, Dharana, Samadhi, is usually referred to as Samyama. So with that, uh, what, let's ask Eddie to explain Dhyan, uh, Dharana, Samadhi as Samyama. Samyama. Okay, so to the best of my abilities, I will do this, of course. Um, the, the chapter three of Yoga Sutra is called the Vibhuti Pada, where we begin to talk about um, the attainments that occur from absorption of focused awareness. And um, the, um, uh, the progression is, first Patanjali says that through the Pratyahara, the mind is prepared for dharana, which you described as focused awareness. And then um, we move to dhyana, which is the, uh, which is where your focused awareness becomes like a steady continuous stream of awareness uh, without any interruptions. In dharana, you can go from point to point to point. Um, so for example, in the dharanas, we talked about the, um, the madhamastanas and the adharas, where you first do a dharana or focused awareness on your toes, your ankles, your knees, the thighs, etc., cetera. Um, and then in dhyana, this becomes a continuous stream of awareness. You're not moving from point to point. And then in samadhi, the only thing that remains is the object of meditation and the meditator falls away. So there's no I anymore meditating. The only thing that remains is the object itself, that which you've been meditating on, whether it's a mantra or, or whatever. And so um, the samyama is this fixing together of all of these three processes, the focused awareness, continuous focused awareness, and the dropping away of the sense of I, so only the object remains. But because we're still meditating on objects, and when I say an object now, you know that I'm not talking about a cup of coffee or, or eyeglasses, I'm talking about, you know, uh, uh, the sense of I or the sense of bliss or an element, you know, or one of the pranas. So these very subtle, subtle objects. Um, or mantra, right? Or mantra. Yeah, or mantra. Mantra so disappears. Yeah, and the only thing that remains is the essence of it. And in that remnant of the essence of the thing that we're meditating on, the inherent dharma or power of that object shines forth in the field of chitta which it then becomes our identification. And we have an inner understanding of what that object is. We, we temporarily become that. We're a perfect reflection of it. And so the vibhutis are um, this long list basically of the different things that we can do samyama of to have a deep inner understanding of them. And the first one which is spoken of is the samyama on time. Uh, which is fascinating in, in, in the moments of time. They really have no inherent uh, existence at all. So the Vibhuti Pada, I'll just say one thing before I give it back to you, Deepak, is that um, they, they get a, have been given a bad rap because people have associated the Vibhutis with um, being super normal powers that will, um, that will impede the practice of Samadhi because there's one Sutra, which is number 37, which is says that the powers are impediments to samadhi, but they're acquisitions in a normal fluctuating state of mind. And, but in this particular sutra, Patanjali is really only talking about one type of power. And that's the power to be able to, um, to uh, know everything, to have super normal powers of hearing, of touch, of sight, of taste, and of smell. And so just to, to address the argument of why you should avoid the vibhutis, which people say, oh, the siddhis are bad, stay away from them. Um, and the word siddhi, by the way, means perfection. If people aren't familiar and they think I'm saying like New York City, it's different, it's S-I-D-D-H-I. -D -D so if we have 
the, um, the supernormal powers from meditating on the sense organs, we can become completely obsessed with what's happening through the sense organs and over identify with them. And that will then disturb um, deeper levels of samadhi. But all of the other vibhutis that come before them, the meditation on time, on friendliness, um, you know, on the kurmanadi, all of these can be beneficial in the strengthening of our ability to focus our awareness where we wish it to be, and then have the true understanding of what we're observing be revealed to us. So that's a little introduction of, of Samyama. That's beautiful. And I see the sequence. So this is the sequence in which they are expressed, yeah. right? Want to read us the sequence? Uh, understanding of time, understanding of words, understanding of birth, understanding of mind, understanding of body, understanding of karma, understanding of friendliness, understanding of strength understanding of sense perception, then sun, moon, star, inner body, survival functions, nervous system, unseen beings, understanding of intuition of the mind and heart connection of purusha, prana, space, the five elements, understanding of the five senses, um, understanding of distinction between, uh, I guess, mind and awareness or intellect and awareness, and understanding of the present moment. So is that the sequence kind of the way- That's the exact have... sequence. Okay. So let's, you know, uh, as you probably know, I was a student of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, And one of the things we did do in our advanced meditations is uh, Sanyama. Some, and uh, is it Samyama or Sanyama or either? Samyama. Samyama. So, yeah. you know, as part of that, we uh, practiced uh, Samyama on things like friendliness, on things like um, the distinction between intellect and witness, on things like transcending the five senses, strength of an elephant, uh, the Samyama, uh, Samyama on the throat for subdued hunger and thirst, mm -hmm. on and on. And in fact, there was, we did the Flying Sutra also, you know, Samyama on the cotton fiber and the flight of a cotton fiber. And interestingly enough, our bodies lifted, you know, when we did Samyama wow. and the bodies would lift. And uh, then they, as soon as you became aware that the body was lifted, it would drop down. Okay. So, but we all had that experience. In fact, I was the one who was the most skeptical about that. And then uh, Rita uh, uh, did it. And as soon as she practiced the sutra, her body lift off. Um, as soon as my daughter Malika was then 12, as soon as she practiced the sutra, her body lifted off. There was one person who was paralyzed and uh, she was 300 pounds. She was paraplegic. And when she was given the sutra, her body lifted up as well. And so I was the last one in the course because I was totally skeptical and that at the end of three weeks, I said, you know, this is nonsense, but I'll do it one more time. And then as soon as I detached from the outcome, I practiced the sutra and my body lifted off and I couldn't stop flying after that, you know, boop, 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 hopping. Now, the experts that we um, consulted, the adepts, you know, because Maharishi also had tantrics in his environment, he had his, um, you know, lineage from the Shankracharya, etc. And when we spoke to these tantrics in the depths, they would say, yes, the Flying Sutra works as like anything else, but it's three stages. One is hopping, the second is floating, <laughs> the third is flying. And you need a certain critical mass of collective consciousness to be enlightened to get through all the stages. So, you know, I have been obsessed with the city since then, not because, well, first of all, no, I should say I've been obsessed because first, first of all, they open the window to what you just used, the super normal. Yeah. And Siddhi means, as you said, one of the translations is super normal pass, but the other is also expanding from local to non-local identity. That's what happens in Samadhi anyway, that you no longer are a local ego identity watching the world. You, the ego, the mind, the intellect, and the world have become one unified 
uh, entanglement of superpositions and possibilities in samadhi. It's all there. So when we practice these siddhis, and it's very interesting that the sequence is there, but I did not see, you know, in your, uh, and maybe it's there, but, you know, the Flying Sutra probably has to do with space and time. And then, you know, there's our sutras for invisibility, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Which I've practiced, by the way. And, you know, when I practice, I notice in uh, airports, nobody bothers me. When, if I practice the sutra on invisibility, I go and notice, which is for me good enough. Whether people can see me or not, they don't notice me. Okay, so I can do that. And I can also change my body persona so it doesn't look um, old or young or, you know, I can, we know these things are possible when you shift internally because the physical body and the physical world is just the fluctuation of uh, I am into I am this, <laughs> you know, the fluctuation of I am is always sensations, perceptions, images, feelings, thoughts, which we then codify as human constructs as mind, body, and the physical world. But, you know, all that's happening is that which we call I am, the impersonal I am is constantly fluctuating right this moment as the experience I call mind, body, and the physical world. And that's a changing experience. You know, it's changing. It started with me as a fertilized egg and it'll end with me as de a dead body in between all these other versions of my mind, of my body and of the physical world that that particular mind body encounters because it's a unified fluctuation of I am as I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, I'm that, I'm this, I'm this thought, I'm this feeling, I'm this idea, I'm this rainbow, I'm this sunshine, I'm this cloud, I'm this mountain, I'm this ocean. It's all true, you know, because consciousness is modifying itself as all these experiences. So to me, even though we say these are siddhis and supernormal powers, these are actually corrections of misperception because our ordinary perception is actually, as we've said, a magical lie. My ordinary perception tells me that the ground I'm standing on is stationary. I know it's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour. My ordinary perception tells me that my body is solid. I don't know it's a changing field of energy, information, a fluctuation of consciousness. My senses tell me that the ground I'm standing on is stationary and it's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour. My senses tell me that I am three-dimensional in the theater of space, time, and causality. But actually, if you go look at my body, ultimately it's formless. It's the formless fluctuating as form and phenomena. So the cities and even the riddhis, which is control over elements and forces of the universe, actually only makes sense when you realize that your ordinary perception of reality is a magical lie. It's a species specific experience that we call human experience, not a crocodile experience, not a dolphin experience, not an eagle experience, which all have their own fluctuations, mind, body, universes with leaky margins. So, you know, all the biological organisms have fluctuating their own universe, but then we have leaky margins because we can communicate. We, you can communicate with your dog, even though the dogs, the bark of a dog may not sound the same to a dog as it sounds to you. Because it's a different nervous system with different frequencies of adaptation to sound or smell. A dog can smell you long after you've left this place. If I leave this room, leave uh, a dog comes five years five hours later he will find my presence in his or her present so what is reality reality is this maya this play of consciousness that we call lila and maya is appearing as bodies as minds and biological organisms which are species specific modes of knowing and even within the species there are more modes of knowing like in the human uh, species modes of knowing that I would say come from the chakras. So if you talk, talk of these chakras as centers of awareness, then the first mode of knowing is the 
first pada, you know, uh, which is security and safety. The second is a sacral mode of knowing, you know, karma devi, if you want to say. The third is a, 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 a board of knowing that has to do with transformation, power or agni or whatever you call it. And then here, board of knowing, love and joy and uh, companion and belonging, mode of knowing, expression, art, music, science, technology, mode of knowing, insight, intuition, inspiration, uh, tanmatras, and then mode of knowing, total transcendence. So these are modes of knowing for what I am fluctuating as I am at this moment Deepak Chopra. But even that fluctuation, Deepak Chopra, is momentary, it's ceaseless, it's a snapshot of perception. The only continuity is I am, which is present in the fluctuation and also present in between the fluctuation, which is the gap, which we call the gap, the gap between thoughts, the gap between sensations, the gap between perception, the gap between an image, the gap between any experience is consciousness seeded with in the individual jiva with karma, memory, sanskara, all of that. And this is what we call reality. But, you know, it's totally fictional. It's totally arbitrary. It's totally learned. Same kind of concepts repeated for thousands of years, even in the Vedanta, snake and rope, snake and rope, snake and rope. It's said so often that you actually forget how profound it is you know, because it becomes a cliche. So for us right now, this conversation that I'm having with you with all these vibhutis is actually a very important conversation because what it is saying is through Samya Ma, we correct the mistake of the intellect, Pragya Parad, it's called Pragya Aparad, the mistake of the intellect, which says artificially that there's an observer, there's a process of observation and there's something called observed or a knower process of knowing, something called the known, seer process of seeing, something called the scenery, but actually they're all consciousness. And this all, this Maya, this is the play, the Leela that is creating this. And our job as yogis is slowly cut the veil of ignorance. So we are liberated from these magical lies that ultimately end up as this karmic body, because this karmic body, this what the Buddhists call the pain body, or some people call the pleasure body, it's the same thing. You know, when you're having pleasure, you worry, this will disappear and I'll have pain. When you're having pain, you say, well, I wonder when I, this will disappear, I'll have pleasure. And all the coexistence of every possible opposite value in the range of infinity. So who am I is this is where this is leading me. I am a conscious agent differentiated from infinity. My biological organism is a changing process, which is a mode of knowing for this experience, which is the human universe with leaky margin. So I can communicate with dogs and cats and ultimately with other species, which is what the cities will ultimately take me. The Siddhis are just shifting of identity from local to non-local. So with that, it becomes very important. I don't want to be distracted by the supernormal powers, but actually I want to know that I am actually that meta-human. I am that being that is at the moment incarnating as the biological process called human being, but actually I'm being human. Well, I mean, that was beautiful. That basically says it all and, and it sums up a lot of what is in the, um, in the Vibhuti Pada. Um, a lot of what you just said is uh, in, you know, in clear contemporary language about what the whole process is. And it's largely um, a process of discernment. And so as long as I think I'm Eddie or you think you're Deepak and you know, we, our levels of discernment 
in relation to the objects of the world around us, including the sun and the moon and the stars and whatever, um, is going to be this, you know, as you said, the seer and the seen and the process of seeing and we'll accept that as reality. And with the samyamas, um, because we are taking on the form of the object itself, like the sun, or like, you know, the pole star, or the kurmanadi, uh, the inherent, let's not use the word power, but the inherent dharma or purpose of that object shines forth in us, and we have an, an understanding and uh, 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 an experience of what that object is. And then um, this helps to refine the overall, let's now use the word power of discernment that the intellect has to strengthen that power of discernment to see the distinction between purusha or consciousness and prakriti nature, that which is always changing and taking on different forms. And so, and so through intentionally identifying ourselves with changing forms and understanding the power or lack of power in them, we strengthen our discernment to understand, ah, oh, this is no longer something for me to objectify. Now I have my own experience of, of why it exists and what it exists for. And that allows us to then form a deeper relationship with consciousness as our true identity. And so, you know, avidya is described as not a full knowing of who we really are. We have a partial knowing. We don't have a full knowing. And, um, and that's also because we set ourselves against the objects of the world or the things of the world. So we become isolated from them. Um, you know, we live in this in exclusive reality like you spoke about um, in, um, in seven spiritual laws. And now um, when we do the samyamas on these and we understand the inherent purpose of every single object in the universe as being interconnected, as all being a movement of the gunas, as all being nature, then all of a sudden we see the oneness of the web of nature, which is taking a myriad of forms, an infinite amount of forms, and then dissolving back into itself and rising up and dissolving back like waves on an ocean. And so what happens is, uh, as far as my understanding is, is that now you could look at an ocean and go, oh, that's a beautiful wave and think that that wave, you know, has real existence. Uh, but it doesn't because then it just goes back down into the water and it's just because of the currents of the ocean and the wind and all that that's creating the wave. So um, that nature is this um, tremendous ocean of potential, which is taking form and the forms are dissolving. But we think that the forms are real and have substance. So um, that's where avidya settles in. Now with the samyamas, we're seeing it's all part of the infinite um, you know, web of nature to rise and fall and rise and fall. And then we rise and fall with it. We understand when something takes form, it has a meaning, a purpose, and a power that we experience and maybe we harness. Um, but all of that is in service of discernment. All of the samyamas are in service of seeing the distinction between Purusha and Prakriti. Some of the longest commentaries in the Yoga Sutras are in chapter three. And um, so many, you know, the scholars don't ignore chapter three, but a lot of yoga practitioners um, do because they think, oh, the superpowers, that's what they are. And those are bad. They're going to get in the way. Actually, it's my favorite chapter as well, because there's the most amazing stuff happening in there. Yeah. You know, when I experienced the flying sutra, it wasn't the flying as much as the validation, the consciousness of field of all possibilities. Yeah. That is what these... Uh, Vibhutis do. They convince you that consciousness field of all possibilities and the objects of perception are modified forms of the self. I mean, it's the first time I understood experientially what it means when you say tatvamasi, you know, mm. and literally that, that I can look at this phone and say tatvamasi. I can look at um, this ring and say tatvamasi. And, you know, in the beginning, it's kind of disconcerting because, first of all, it's slowly unraveling everything that you thought was your identity. And there's almost a panic, uh, you know, existential crisis almost. 
uh, and I've been through it. I mean, I've had the heebie-jeebies. So we're thinking about this uh, in the middle of the night, who am I? If all this is just a fluctuation of Purusha as Prakriti, where do I fit in? And who is this guy who's worried about fitting in? And because if he is a fictional character, is the fictional character now having existential anxiety? Or is what is having this existential anxiety? Now you talk to all these great yogis and some of them re repeat the same formula, snake and rope, snake and rope, you know, then they, you, they're right. They're not saying anything that's not true. But you start to wonder if they are speaking experientially because they're all repeating the same formulas. Even the books, you know, you're saying thing over and over and over again. Where is that experience? Because if you had the experience, you wouldn't warn people of the dangers of supernormal powers you would say this is normal and everything else is a mistake of the intellect. That Tvamasi holds true under all circumstances. Aham Brahmasmi holds true under all circumstances. Satchit Ananda holds true under all circumstances. Yeah. This is the true Ananda Shakti that we have recourse to. And therefore liberation is not anything to be anxious about. Liberation is something to be totally joyful. That's why we call it Ananda. Yeah. So, you know, this is a very important discussion right now because, you know, in the yoga community, there's a lot of confusion about these ideas. And, you know, Hari Harananda, whose, whose commentaries I love on Yoga Sutra, he basically says that um, to, you know, to understand the latent power of any object, to experience the latent power of any object is a siddhi. So he doesn't talk about it necessarily like a super normal power. Why is it super? Because you understand really what the true power of any object is. So to understand the latent purpose, power, and meaning of any object is a siddhi. Um, and, and he further says to understand the latent power of the mind is divinity. So to experience divinity, you understand the latent power of your mind. Uh, and that's Ishwara Pranidhana, that connection. And, the, and to understand nature and all the objects of it um, is, is Siddhi. So, um, so it's an interesting distinction he makes there that obviously the objects of the world are useful and Patanjali says, what does the world exist for? Experience and liberation. And the experience will, will help you towards liberation. But I had one question for you. Um, you mentioned um, Siddhi and Hridhi. And these are uh, the wives of Ganesha, or let's say the Shaktis of Ganesha. Okay. So, um, and I've heard you speak about that before. So w tell me like a little bit about this from what you've learned from Maharishi about, about, about how that fits into yoga. Ganesh is the symbolic expression of the archetype, um, came from Shiva and Shakti, Shiva and Parvati, and is represented as a symbolic archetype embodying their energies and um, is the remover of obstacles. So every, every part of Ganesha's body or the way he sits, is saying something, you know, Trishul here, independent of the three gunas, but also aware of Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, all those three principles, just this symbol here. Big ears, best listener, listens with the flesh, listens with the heart, listens with the soul, listens with the spirit. Trunk has the strength of an elephant, but is discernment also. It can pick a needle in a haystack or it can uproot a tree. So it's both strength and discern discernment. One foot established in the absolute ground, one lifted in the relative. A big belly, give me all your problems, I'll solve them. I'll digest them for you because I have the best Agni in the world. Snake wrapped around his belly it's the ego under his control. You know, it's it's not going on and off on its own. It's being watched by this amazing seer who is the combination of Shiva and Shakti. 
And then the riddhis and the siddhis are the divine feminine that says, don't worry, if we, we'll, we'll hold your back. Okay, so if you need the uh, remove obstacles, the goddess Siddhi says, I'll do it for you. And the goddess Riddhi says, I'll even change the elements and forces of the universe because we are the elements and forces of the universe. They're derivatives of pure consciousness. So actually every little aspect of him, including he's holding a rope, which is climb the tree of knowledge, maybe sometimes an ax to destroy the veil of ignorance, uh, a flower or a fruit, the fruit of knowledge, uh, and all these things that every single aspect is actually a reminder of your symbolic self. These are symbols of the absolute as it expresses itself as the relative in the theater of space-time causality with karma recycling as repeated experiences, including confusion of rape, uh, rope and snake and all that, till you finally get it. And you say, oh, you know, that was all a mistake. Uh, I've corrected my misperceptions. This is normal. What we call the super normal is the normal. So you could say that maybe uh, Ganesha is the embodiment of the transcendent, uh, transcendent principle and Hridhi and Siddhi are, as his Shaktis, are the manifestations of the creative principle, maintaining cosmic order and all of the other things that nature is yeah, ruled. Which is called rhythm, rhythm, no. with, with the English word rhythm or uh, harmony or the cosmic the order. Dharma. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And then the rhythm as cosmic order is like the dharma of the universe, the cosmos, and our personal, you know, purpose, meaning, and order is dharma. So we have our dharma, we have the cosmic ritam, and then we have the transcendent principle, which is overseeing and guiding all of it. So there's this continuous uh, alignment. This is what it should be about. And this is what yoga is truly about, you know, uh, starting with everything that we've discussed, the niyamas and the yamas and all the preparation with the pranayam and the yoga asanas and then the pratyahara and then the dharna, dhyan, samadhi, ultimately for what? Liberation, yeah. enlightenment. So I think the siddhis are extremely important. Now, I've had experiences with seers where I've witnessed um, the riddhis, you know, in one switch like this, a flash of lightning in the sky, and one switch like this, a flash of lightning, gone. And what I realized is it was just a perceptual trick, just like a magical trick, because everyday reality is a magical perceptual trick anyway. So what you do is all you're correcting is mistakes of perception to show yourself that you are for real Aham Brahmasmi, for real, you are the universe, non-metaphorically speaking. Yeah. That's yoga, yoga for enlightenment. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this has been very useful, Eddie, I hope uh, uh, you have enjoyed it as much I've, as I have. I've enjoyed every minute of it. This has been super. So, uh, Carolyn, uh, can I give?